Hi, everyone. We're going to be doing a rise of a theory of natural selection in this Zoom meeting. So this will be a, you know, a voice over PowerPoint that will be in, stored on YouTube. This will be just a link to it. Additionally, um, I also have a regular PowerPoint with the built-in sound files. That's right above this one. So if you want a permanent copy of that PowerPoint, it's a great way to download it, have it on your own. But if it's easier for you to watch these lectures, so it's, it's easier to actually rewind over the voice thing by just going to the YouTube by moving the slider back and forth versus utilizing those little sound files, which are built into the PowerPoints themselves, which are really hard to deal with. So hopefully this will be helpful, but the, but the lectures I'm going to be giving are both going to be about the same. So let me go ahead and start it. All righty. So on this one, the rise of a scientific theory of evolution really is about, you know, what happens after the time of Copernicus. Now, what are the important things that are going to be uh, culminating together knowledge-wise that Darwin's going to be proving to? He's going to really know, which is really going to allow him to conceive of a of his theory of natural selection. Now, two of the major things in which are, are gonna have to be overcome for Darwin and the rest of society really to embrace natural selection are, are these elements here. And we can see these on this title slide. Fixity of the species, right? In other words, the, the species can change, that there's nothing immutable about these things. They're not just placed here one time on earth and they stay this way forever. And the next is this idea of narrowness of time. In a previous slideshow, we've been looking at, you know, how people have sort of determined the time through religious, you know, interpretations like Bishop of uh, Bishop Usher, James Usher, who said the earth was created, you know, in 4004 BC. That's a very narrow window of time compared to what we know about the earth now, which the creation of the earth, and really this formation, really was in place by about 4.5 billion years ago. So, you know, there's a real difference between a few thousand years ago and billions of years. So, to understand how natural selection really works, we need to understand some principles of deep time. So that's really one of the things I've been trying to do for you is help you really understand how long time is so that you can think about it in those sorts of terms. And Darwin had to be able to think in deep time for sure. And those are really the important aspects that we're gonna start discussing today. And there's a few more things too that Darwin needed to sort of conceive of uh, to make the best of his journey when he went aboard the Beagle to be able to formulate natural selection. Okay. So with Darwin, this is one of the, uh, his most famous sort of uh, um, you know, quotes, but it's a quote what we have to really think about. Uh, and it'll make sense uh, uh, after I read exactly what's happening in here, okay? So it says, it is not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. Now he says not the individuals, but the species. So that's like the trick here. You can't be thinking about an individual member of a species, but the species must be responsive to change. And what that means is the species must change, you know, between generations in a way in which can accommodate changes in the future. In other words, put out significant amounts of variation so that at least a few or one member of that species will have the necessary characteristic to be responsive, right, to, to meet the needs of the future. And that's exactly what Darwin was trying to say, that variation is where it's at. And that's one thing that he had to try to understand is that how species put out variation and that they do. And this variation can be differentially placed into the future where we can see changes in species throughout time. So let's think about the information that he had to actually acquire in his head to get to even a statement like that, which prior to his, to this age of maybe probably 25, Darwin would not be able to even conceive of, the, of that statement, which he wrote at his age of about 32. So what did Darwin take in? What information did he have in his mind? And what did he see to allow him to conceive of this? All right. Well, the stranglehold that was sort of over the entire communities at that time, and, and Darwin himself, you know, extends way back to, uh, you know, Aristotle, right, right back to the ancient Greeks, this idea of a fixity of life. You know, for the Greeks, what happened was, is that the creators, the, the gods, were constantly trying to produce, you know, better life. You know, they would, they would get better at it. The first ones were like nematode worms, and they got frogs, and they got snakes, and beavers, and they kept putting out, you know, different creatures, and finally they got good at it, and out comes the mighty human, and then that's where they stopped. And there was this great chain of perfection, increasing per perfection from the lowly forms, you know, to the higher forms. And they call this the scala natura, the scala natura. Well, you know, uh, Christians sort of, you know, 
borrowed on this idea, which is kind of unusual because they, they were really a very pagan culture, these uh, these early ancient Greeks, uh, but changed it in a little different way. That, that, that Yes, there's a scale of nature. Right? There are less improved forms and more improved forms, but all of that was placed on earth at once at the time of creation. Everything was created in this ex nihilo thing all at one time, bam, so seven days, it's all done, versus this constant attempt. Whatever the creator was, he knew exactly what he was doing, and he placed the humans at the top as dominions of over over all the lower forms, right? So it was sort of a this idea that was inculcated from the Greeks, but nevertheless, it ended up being the same sort of idea. Everything was fixed, immutable, not changing through time, and sort of a great chain of being in fixed positions. All right, so how do you overcome something like this? Well, one of the ways is by exploring the world. And looking at the problems, the, what the uh, biblical texts say, particularly where the Christian texts and the Old Testament say about you know the origins of life and how things have changed on Earth. Well, uh, one of the bigger stories in in the Testament, the one that's that's everywhere, everyone's sort of held to, is the idea of Noah's Ark and these great floods, these catastrophic sort of events that have happened on the Earth's surface, um, and that were supposed to be well documented in 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 the in the Bible. The, early New Testament. And with Noah, it was the flood that ravaged the entire earth. And of course, he was the, the carrier of all species, you know, the pairs of everything, the breeding pairs that could repopulate the earth when it was done. Well, fine. If you're just a Mediterranean person, you know, maybe in the local Middle East, the limited number of species they have there can might be fit into one boat if you almost literally puree everything together readily. I mean, it's, it's, it's still a tight fit. When, when explorers started going out in the world, they're watching millions of species. Today, there's over 14,441,900 species, and that's not going to fit on one boat. So the explorers are looking at this, and they're looking at the discrepancies in the, in the Bible. And it's not necessarily shaking their faith, but changing their interpretation, the way in which they're looking at the Bible. It's not a literal text anymore. It's becoming metaphorical. That may be very important words, you know, for 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 people, but much more metaphorical than it had existed, you know, in previous generation. And this is allowing for more latitude and openness of thinking and the possibilities. And certainly for Darwin too. Uh, now, next is something that happened that, um, uh, in light of all this exploration, the church is getting nervous. You know, Copernicus is out there with the science. Everyone's doing science now. Uh, and self-determination. People are saying that if we're going to make the, the world better, that, that prayer is fine, but really it comes down to us doing it ourselves, right? So the piousness is sort of leaving, and the church is not getting this income that it wanted to, and the, you know, a lot of the, the, I would call it the overarching, the hierarchy, and the power the hierarchy has is fading. You know, it, it, the influence is fading. So how is the church going to get this back? But one of the agents is this guy here named James Usher. He was a bishop in the church, Bishop Usher. It was an Anglican uh, a, a bishop. Um, so, um, you know, he had a pretty good voice. He was a primate of all Ireland, you know, and he was a really important guy. So what he decided to do um, was figure out, you know, the age of the earth according to what the Bible uh, was, was said, the hidden things in the Bible. So he thought he was going to use, he pretended he was using something called science, but it wasn't science. What he did was he took all the generations that appear in the New Testament and the Old Testament, all the generations leading all the way back to Adam and Eve, and he said, well, on average, there's 21 years between generations. So he took the number of generations in all the Testaments and he multiplied them by 21. And he said, aha, that dates the earth at 4004 BC. And because he thought that this idea on October 23rd at nine o'clock in the morning, he said, that's when God placed it in his head to do that. Therefore, the earth was created at nine o'clock in the morning, October 23rd, 4004 BC. Okay. So people go, we've done it. He's used science to determine the age of the earth, right? And it was all along, you know, ex nihilo creation only 4,000 years ago, right? Well, you can think of the fallacies within all of this. Uh, one is that you're relying on, you know, the scriptures themselves of all the generations back to that data number of generations, right? Which is, which is not science at all. Uh, utilizing math to multiply things is not science. Math is not science. It's a way of actually testing the hypothesis. Right, and designing an experiment. So, but people at that period of time didn't know how science worked. They knew nothing about it. But they didn't know how to add or subtract or multiply. You know, basic mathematical skills didn't even exist. So for them, it was like, you know, it, it, was, it, it was science. It was seemed like almost a magical way of determining it. Now, for people like Darwin, who were um, 
you know, coming around and young scientists, you can, de you can definitely see once you understand the scientific method, the fallacies of this. So for Darwin, it was like, we really wanted to believe in this because he went to school, you know, uh, at Cambridge, his final degree was in divinity. He, he wanted to be a minister or Parsons, you know, in England. He really wanted to believe this, but the methods themselves are so shoddy that they were sort of vile to him at the same time. And by understanding how science is supposed to operate, and you see something like this, it sets up that, that, that doubt that allows you to see out of the box. This is very important in some ways. Now, as far as Darwin too, we have to understand that one of the reasons that he was able to sort of, you know, get on the beagle and want to go on the beagle is because there's a little prize at the end of it. And I think that people don't think about this, even in the context of your own life, that sort of the challenges we make against each other and the competitions really drive us. So, you know, as much as there's basketball games between cities and rivalries, there's also rivalries between nations. And the bigger, biggest rivalries, you know, at this per particular period in time uh, were between France and Britain. They've always had a rivalry with each other. Uh, you know, whether it was colonialism, it's been ideas, uh, uh, anything, they've always been rivalry because they're both kind of cultural chauvinists in, in a way. Well, you know, over this idea about do species change or not, or, or you know, how old the earth is, one and the other, they're going to be following back, you know, a different ideas about this, trying to get the upper hand. Now, on the, on the uh, uh, French side, they're always going to sort of stick in the religious camp. There's always going to be some sort of religious thing around it because they're very, you know, they're a very Catholic, uh, Catholic uh, society. So let's see how one of the very first thinkers of France begins to come up with an idea and how Darwin might respond to this thing. So this guy named Comte de Riffon uh, comes up with this idea. He said that there was one center of creation, right? He called it the Garden of Eden. He wanted to call it that. And uh, it was all perfect. The environment was perfect. Therefore, the creatures were perfect. But once the creatures began to move away from this, this center of creation, uh, they moved into environments which were not as good. And, and they were the degenerate environments. And the environment had an effect on the organisms and caused them to degenerate. So if you move away from the center of creation, you go downhill over a period of time. And he said, well, you know what? Since you can't really see it happening in the world very, very quickly, it must happen very slowly. So he, he thought maybe the world was like 75,000 years old, like what a total guess. Well, you know, he didn't want to do something like, you know, millions of years old because that would be way off the rail. But he also realized that the scientists in Britain were sort of postulating the earth could be much older than 4,004 big you know, years of age, you know, conceivably millions of years of age. So he wanted to come up with sort of a middle figure that wasn't too far from the religious one. So he just nailed it. He just said, he nailed it. He said, he just guessed at 75,000, right? Well, let's have a look at what he said about this spontaneous generation and, and look at what happens when you don't do science very well and the harm that it can actually do to. All right, so here's his model. There's our little area of creation. He actually wanted to make it in France. He thought the best, the center of creation must be fair France, right? But he thought he wasn't going to push it because the British might put back, push back too hard. So he said, okay, up there in the north, there's the northern origin where all life begins in the Garden of Eden. And then it moves away, including human beings, into a foul environment. So when the Europeans started going to Africa, they thought it was foul. They thought it was a horrible, it was hard to get through. This Britain prepared for a little different, you know, region of the world. And they said, this is a degenerate environment. Therefore, humans have lived here must degenerate too. So any human beings living in Africa must be of a lower order and form. And that's the beginning of racism. This guy literally helps gender racism over a, a whacked out theory like this, you know, and leads to the domination of other people simply because they are degenerated forms. And if they can be removed from those degenerate environments and taken back into good environments, over time, they may revert and become good people again. In other words, white people it was ridiculous this, re this type of racism they had and they also called it was white man's burden to make sure that that happened you know and literally you know hold them back into environments which are more hospitable for human beings we see he did this without any use of science without any use of truth right and he postulated this right out of his own head and look at the damage that came from something like that it's just horrific well, at the same time, you know, folks like, like Darwin are looking at something like this, asking, well, what's the mechanism for this spontaneous degeneration? What sort of evidence do you have for it? any proof for it? And of course, you know, with Buffon, nothing but, you know, uh, really subjective opinions like, well, look at other people in the world. You know, 
they're, they're, they're this, they're that. And he was making these raw stereotypes to sort of justify sort of his opinions. And sort of that world of opinion gets inculcated in this whole thing. And the science of it completely washes out. There's zero science involved in it. Okay. So now Britain, of course, has to, you know, rear back at something like this because it's a ridiculous idea. Well, one way it does is by trying to get at what the age of the earth really is. I mean, in scientific sort of ways. Um, and, you know, the first real guy that actually does it is this guy by the name of James Hutton. Um, he's a physician. Uh, he, he works and actually teaches at the University of Edinburgh up in Scotland. And in those days, I mean, uh, if you were well respected, you could actually open up another university department, you know, like a physician like this. You know, it, there weren't university departments called earth science or geology then. So he wanted to start one. And that just means he had to do some research and become a good geologist. So what he does on his free time, he goes up in the highlands of Scotland and he's investigating uh, um, these valleys, which are cut out by glaciers. You can tell by these big U-shaped valleys where all the ice would scour through and break the rock down, the rock breaking down to smaller, smaller pieces and then eventually get washed out on the streams and rivers. So he went up in the highlands and he could saw some glaciers still up there. And he wanted to know, you know, how long it took to cut these valleys out. So he had his assistants put in sediment traps. They were catching all the sands and stuff in some of these streams and they were weighing it, you know, how much sediment would come out per year. Well, they could look at how much rock was missing in the valley, get the weight of that, the average weight of it by multiplying, you know, the size of it and then divide how much they get out per year. And lo and behold, you know, they're getting figures of like eight and 11 million years for glaciation that would be going on in these areas. And that's just in these areas. So he said, you know, this, the earth we're living on is millions of years old. I don't have the data to be able to try to demonstrate that it's older than 13 million years or not. So I'm not going to say anything. He just said millions. And he responsibly said this. He goes, we find no vestige of a beginning and no prospect of an end. All right. That statement there is incredibly important uh, for us and for Darwin, too, because it leads into a bigger statement that you have to embrace before you understand natural selection. And that is the process is that we're cutting out those glaciers, what, what Hutton was seeing, and the processes that are happening now are the same things. You know, he's, he's looking at the same geological processes that are happening now that are happening in the past. And those processes are gonna happen in the future. They're natural processes that happen all the time because they're part of nature. And not just geological process, also processes of life. So if you're looking at life in the past, you know, whatever is causing it to change and go about its changing will be operating right now and it'll also be operating in the future. And that is a paradigm, an unbroken paradigm that we embrace in all of geological sciences. And you know what, really in biological sciences too, called uniformitarianism. People think it's a religious term, it's not. So I have a little brief, you know, a sort of, a, a definition there right there you can see on the on the slide in front of you but it's basically what i've just told you and it was hutton that did this first and he put it out in a book in 1788 you know roughly 23 years before darwin was born and this is something that darwin would have been privy to he would have read about this and known very much about this you know as compared to the arguments that were happening you know on the on the french side and of course he is a young budding sort of you know a scientist himself and an explorer, he's going to be in getting himself involved in these things for, you know, to make a career. And that's how you sort of make yourself in the world by doing things like Hutton has done. And, and, and Darwin's definitely up to that challenge. Now, the last thing I think that sort of uh, makes uh, taking the, the French down very easy was they just couldn't let go of the whole religious thing. Uh, they could never really embrace science and do it correctly. Um, and they end up messing everything else everything they've done up. That. In fact, the, Brit the French had never really done anything, you know, uh, uh, up until probably the turn of the 19th century, or the 20th century. The French has never invented a damn thing. They just didn't know what they were doing. They could never embrace science. In fact, if you even look at the colonial agents of the big powers that were going on, Britain had the largest holdings of, any, of the entire world because they had the technology, they had the science to do it. Not that it was a good thing, colonialism was a bad thing, but compared to what what France had done, it was France was minimal, was so minimal compared to what was happening in Britain. And it was because of ideas like this guy here, George Cuvier. You know, who would come out and say, Well, I know how things change. 
it's back to the flood. It's back to catastrophism. God just smites the earth and everything gets killed. So you can look at fossils in the past. Of course, they're going to be dead because God smited them with another flood. So he held on to this so much, held on to this so much. And he was such a good orator. He was so, he was so fiery in his convictions. It's sort of like the Donald Trump of his time. He, oh, he just ran raving up and people believe him, you know, which is really not a very smart thing to do. But, you know, guys like this are putting ideas out like that, so fiery, like you'll go to hell unless you believe this or not, that France began to wane away from the arguments, away from serious arguments, you know, leaving sort of Britain on the spotlight, you know, and that's opening up for the window for guys like Charles Darwin to chart some very successful careers if they can come up with good scientifically grounded theories. And now we're going to be sort of getting into the life of, of, of Charles Darwin as he sort of gets into that voyage in the Beagle. And we'll be going into seeing what he actually saw and how he formulated his theory of natural selection. A few more words before we go. Okay. Uh, there's some other folks that were really important too. Um, uh, this dude here comes in, this guy named Johann Rye, Rye, Reinhold Forster, right? So he goes out with, with James uh, Cook on his big uh, journeys around the world, exploration journeys. And, you know, Cap Captain Cook was never. You know, it didn't really have any paths he was going. He wasn't doing some sort of like, you know, exact sort of, uh, you know, uh, survey of the earth. He was just going to different ports and trying to get a basic overview of what was out there. And so he took this guy out here named Rhino Forrester, who was really collecting information about the outside world, where the resources were. If they're going to go be colonial agents. Of course, colonialism is about taking resources from people, as horrible as it is. So what's out there? But he was a very keen observer. And he was looking for patterns in nature. And one of the patterns that he saw is that there is latitude. As you move up and down latitude, there's pretty much a correlation for the type of life that you're going to see, the forms of life you're going to see, depending on the latitude in which you travel. So if I'm at the 33rd parallel, you know, in one area of the world, and I'm at the 33rd parallel in some other of the world, I'm probably going to see the same forms of life. There may be slight variations of each other, but the forms are going to look the same. The adaptations are the same. So he saw this basic sort of pattern. You know, he was never to able to do a full study because you know his 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 work was also collecting other things like sort of re real raw resources were out there. But it was enough in his notes when he came back and he published these things to sort of put other ideas in a future generation. And it was in the future generation that was going to set these things into real scientific stones, and they were really really valuable that Darwin definitely fed upon. And the guy who picked up on this guy's work is right here. I love this guy, Alexander von Humboldt. They named Humboldt State University after him. This is Alexander von Humboldt. Humboldt State's the first state university in, in, in California. Right? I went to school, I did one of my degrees there. It's a great place to go to school. But. So Alexander von Humboldt. So he's considered the follower of, of phytogeography, um, which really means this, what he studied was Exactly how does vegetation, even animal life, vary between elevation, latitude and longitude, right, and rainfall, temperature and rainfall? What's the correlation? So he, he started mapping, you know, how uh, temperature and rainfall work together, what we call isobars and isotherms. So he could look at places like the United States and look at zones or particular zones where those zones exist. You could find particular types of forms of life particular types of forms that have adapted to those places. So if you went to a desert, it doesn't matter where you're at. If it's the same sort of desert, you're gonna find the same sorts of plants, whether it's in China, the Gombe Desert, or if it's a cold weather desert, even like the high plains of, of like Nevada, you're gonna find similar plants and species. And therefore he said, you know, the, the world is organized, you know, into studyable components, that the life within it fits within these necessary environments. And he said, because it's that, it's not this willy-nilly creation thrown everywhere. There's a pattern to it, a system to it. He's beginning to identify this system. So this is exactly what Charles Darwin was going to be doing when he went to South America. He's really taking off on what Alexander von Humboldt started. So he's gonna to try to look at where resources are, plant resources, animal resources, and all sorts of resources, and how the climate varies, you know, as he maps these things in South America to see if the colonial powers that Britain want to go there, if they want to risk, you know, putting in forces and doing what they want to do. And Darwin it really wasn't privy to that. He was just trying to get, you know, the information. But this is the way that he was really doing his systematic studies. 
And he had to have this sort of information in his head and how to do this and what he was doing before he could think about those species that were there he was looking at. Why would he see variation in them? And how would he formulate how they would change in the time? But he needed to know this absolutely. He needed to know this first. Okay. So um, the last big attempt, I think, by, by France to put something together, which really uh, engendered, uh, I think, the greatest push for uh, people in Britain, including you know, Darwin, to come up with a really good theory, one that held and one that was true about how species changed, how evolution worked on Earth, um, was to sort of sort of defeat this guy. Um, I call him, you know, France's last hope. This is the French last hope. And his name was Lamarck, a John Baptiste Lamarck. So he put out this theory, right? And it was called the, the inheritance of acquired characteristics. You know, and we call it more colloquially Lamarckism. So what this theory basically says is that, you know, uh, that there's some stressor in your adult life, there's some stressor and it creates some chemical in your body that you transfer to, you know, your, your whatever, your reproductive system. And that gets transferred into your offspring, causing them to change, to adapt to the new stressor. So it doesn't stress them, they, they're more improved. So I, a good example of this is what he actually used himself, which is in giraffes. We said, you know, the giraffes started out with short necks when the, when the trees were short. Um, and then as the trees got bigger, this, the giraffes were stretching their necks so much that, you know, it caused some chemical to develop in the neck. And that chemical drifted down and interfered, it got involved in the reproductive system. And then those characteristics ca were, were caused the, the, the fetus to change, right? A permanent change in the fetus, which meant the fetus was going to have a, a longer neck. And that fetus could reproduce you know, other uh, offspring with longer and longer necks, right? So, you know, this is not how natural selection works. This is not, there's no chemical that does this. But when Lamarck said this, he had no way of proving there was a chemical, but there was, at that time period, there's no way of proving there wasn't a chemical. And that's an awfully bad position to be in when someone posits something like this because there's no way to actually sort of disprove it. But because he hadn't sort of looked at, utilized any scientific principles to try to, 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 to be able to, to support this, in Britain, they knew that there was a really good chance that they could take this sort of, of, of model and destroy it. And the ones that did that were actually going to rise to fame, you know, and Darwin would be one of the figures that would do that. And he actually knew that quite well. Okay. All right. So um, a couple of little things that maybe keep on our mind, which you're going to see in the film that David Attenborough sort of puts together. Um, another way of sort of thinking about uh, how Darwin uh, is going to change you know, his line of thinking, sort of sort of conceive of natural selection, um, is uh, what, what he read. One of the things he read here by Thomas Malthus. You know, five years before Darwin was born, um, this guy wrote an essay called Principles of Population, and he was a parson. Uh, you know, he was worried about the poor, you know, and uh, he kept thinking, you know, if Britain keeps growing the way it is, a high population, and and people are moving in from the, the rural, the hinterlands into the cities. No one's going to be farming and everyone's going to be consuming lots of food. And eventually the population is going to run out of food and starvation. Who's going to starve first? The poor. The poor. So he was worried about this. So he presented, you know, his information, you know, a lot of times in graphs. And this is sort of a little mock up of, up of one of his graphs. And it's called Malthusian growth. So in Darwin saw this, he was reading his principal population and this, this little thing grabbed him here. So you see the resources, food and resources. And finally, the population will begin to go up so high and so quickly, it'll outstrip the resources. Then what happens? Well, then you're gonna have a major population crash and the organism, in his, this case, people will begin to die. Well, Darwin you know, read this uh, you know, earlier in his life when he was a student. And then he revisited, you know, after he got back from his voyage in the Beagle, like when he was in, he was like, he was in his 30s. And he said, you know, I've read that before, but it doesn't make sense because that's not the way that it works. Darwin's practical experience said that he never sees animals starve. They just don't in the wild. There's always going to be enough food for them. It's very rare for this ever to happen. And that's because every time a population begins to come up near its resource curve, it always is in check by a predator population. It's like if you looked outside and all of a sudden you see a lot of rats starting to develop in your neighborhood, next thing you're gonna see are cats. You know, feral cats are gonna start breeding very rapidly and their populations are gonna swell up and the rat populations are gonna go down. 
predator increases will always check the increases of other populations, you know, and that's how it works, you know, it's always kept below that resource line. And then Darwin started thinking, ah, so that's the purpose of over-replication? Because, well, all organisms always replicate more individuals than can survive. That's just the way it is, you know. You know, in the turtle world, they, you know, turtles maybe lay a thousand eggs and maybe for 65 individuals to survive. What's the purpose of that? Why over-replicate? Is it just to keep this predator-prey relationship going? Is, is that the entire purpose of it? Or is there something bigger that we're not seeing? And then he started to think about it. There's something bigger that we're not seeing here. That over-replication is about engendering variation, right? Remember the very first comment that I made, that very first paragraph I read you by Darwin, the idea that a species must engender lots of variation, which means more individuals that can survive because that's exactly what's gonna happen. Only some of those are gonna survive because hopefully some of those will be more improved and less vulnerable to the predation around them and constantly improving as species generation after generation after generation. And that Malthusian growth was one of the things that really helped him sort of envision that too. And we'll look at other things. Now, the last thing they'll look at is uh, what we're gonna be looking at next. You know, we do need to have some idea about how geology works, how fossils are created, where we find fossils and what they tell us, because we're going to be looking at the fossil record for the remainder of the course. This is just the primer stuff. Well, same thing with, with, with Darwin. You know, he studies to sort of be a minister and he, and he gets some good idea about botany. He becomes a relatively good botanist. And that's how he gets on the beagle to be a naturalist. But he doesn't know anything about geology. So just by happenstance, um, the captain of the Beagle, which, you know, the boat, which is Darwin's going to leave on in 1831, um, is a guy named Rob Fitzroy. And Rob Fitzroy's a character. He's afraid he's going to go crazy if he had nothing to talk to but the Scallywags, just the working crew. I won't be able to talk to them. I'm the captain. I'll be alone for five years on this voyage and I'm going to lose my mind. So, you know, when he's interviewing people to take on the boat, you know, guys like Darwin, he's looking for good conversationalists. And Darwin is. Darwin can talk. And, and Fitzroy thinks this guy's going to be a delightful conversationist. So I'm going to buy him some presents so he doesn't let, you know, run, get scared and not go on the voyage. So one of the presents he buys Darwin is a book that had come out just the year before uh, the Beagle's going to leave. I mean, almost at the exact same time. And it's a really expensive book, Big Knife Gift, called Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell. Oh, man, this is a landmark geology book. It really explains a lot of the principles of Earth, how the Earth is formed through natural principles, discoverable principles, not things that were just created by the Almighty Creator, how it was placed here by natural forces. You know, a really a good scientific study. And um, Fitzroy just happens to give it to Darwin as a gift. And of course, you know, Darwin wants to read it because it is a gift book. And this is going to change his perspective. And one perspective is going to change is his ability to see deep time really start thinking on deep time because if he doesn't do that, he won't have a chance to sort of understand how natural selection works. So that's what we have to do too. Okay? And that, that book is so very important. Well, the, a little side note here, he, he had more than just volume one. He was so enthralled by that book. By the time he got uh, to South America, um, he had finished one and he'd heard that volume two was coming out. So he since a, a supply ship was going back with instructions of, of all the supplies they get, make sure you get volume two of this book for, for Mr. Darwin. And they did. So he got volume two and he read that thing when he was in South America. And then we'll be talking a little bit later about what was in these volumes or the principles that allowed Darwin to see the world in a different way. And hopefully you will too, as we look at geological and paleontological principles in the last section of this module. Okay, so I'm gonna stop this share uh, right here. And I'll see you guys in the next lecture.